Greetings, my prince. It is good to see you, but I had thought you would be present at the feast. Huh. Snuck off at the height of it, eh? Well, you are welcome here, my boy. If you would toss another log onto the fire before you sit. What's that? The Nordheimer. <laughs> what makes you ask of them, my prince? Was your father regaling the guests with tales of his youth again? How he longs more and more for those days. Eh. But of course, I know much about Nordheim. I have traveled to many of the far countries of the world, my boy. And Nordheim, I count among them. Or rather, the twin countries of Nordheim. For the land is divided in two, both physically and culturally. It lies far to the north, beyond your father's homeland of Cimmeria, past the Iglofian Mountains. The Blue Mountains erupt from that previous range to divide Nordheim in half, and an ancient feud divides the people. But perhaps I wander ahead of us. Before we continue, my boy, it is important to note that the people of Nordheim, the Nordheimer, are indeed one people, but they exist in two distinct cultural groups. You must remember this for when you are king, my prince. Both nations have their own ethos and mannerisms, and yet, despite this, they are still Nordheimer. This cultural divide was started long ago, in a time before history, when a feud between two great chieftains tore the people into two armed camps. No one can truly remember the cause of this feud, but the two camps became the Aesir and the Venir. The Aesir people the eastern reaches of Nordheim. They call their nation Asgard and their land borders Hyperborea to the east and Cimmeria to the south. The Vanir control the western coastlines of Nordheim. Their nation is named Vanaheim, and they border the Pictish wilderness to the south and the wild, untamed sea to the west. Vanir tend to have red gold hair, while the Aesir have hair of pale blonde. Both groups are tall, and tend to have pale blue or green eyes. They are both the same people, my prince, but they are distinct in terms of their cultural expression. The Aesir are loud, but joyous. They have a rich tradition of storytelling and lore interwoven throughout their society, and feasts often revolve around the narration of a tale. The men and women of the Aesir are as equals, the women may hold land, even rule over their fellows, but they are also expected to engage in battle. Indeed, Aesir women are truly fearsome foes, every bit a match for Aquilonian metal. The Aesir worship Odin, Freya, and their ilk, and believe that they dwell in a heavenly hall called Valhalla a place controlled by the one-eyed god where the honored dead go to rest after falling in battle. To the Aesir, the Hall of Valhalla is constantly bathed in a warm, inviting glow, like the warm allure of a well-tended hearth. The Vanir, on the other hand, are also loud and boisterous, but where the Aesir are storytellers, the Vanir are boastful and arrogant. They will compete to make the boldest claim of daring at feasts. Veneer are quick-tempered and apt to take offense at the smallest of perceived slights. They worship the Ice Father Ymir and his ilk, whom they believe controls the vaunted halls of Valhalla. To the Veneer, Valhalla shines with pure bright light that blinds all who look upon it, much like the shining brightness of a fresh snowfall under the sun. Ymir is a powerful deity, and his worship has been spread across the world by Vanir sailors. 
Indeed, the sea is central to life in Vanaheim. While the Aesir control much of Nordheim's fertile heartland, the Vanir control the coast. They are adroit shipbuilders and sailors, and they use their sturdy vessels to raid as far south as the lands of Argos and Shem. There is another divide in Nordheim, but it is one that both groups share. The land of the north is harsh, and it grows more so the further north one travels. In the south of Nordheim, the land is hilly, but it contains sheltered, fertile valleys. Forests and scrub brushes grow, and it is easier for people to eke out a living. The further north one goes, however, the more pervasive the tundra becomes. The ground freezes in the constant grip of winter until the black soil at last gives way to white, grinding ice. The Nordheimer of the north of their land live purely nomadic lives, similar to those of the Hyrcanians. They live in easy-to-transport yurts and hide tents and roam the land following the migrations of the scant herds that can survive so far north. The Nordheimer of the south, whether Vanir or Asir, live much more settled lives. There are no great cities in Nordheim, but there are countless small villages spread across the south, usually constructed around the local ruler's mead hall. The men of the north are ruled by chieftains, but the Nordheimer of the south have much more structured lives. This divide, the divide between north and south, cuts across both the Aesir and the Venera alike, and I repeat this because it is important for you to remember, my king. One can expect a stark difference between Nordheim from both nations, depending upon how close they live to that mysterious frozen wilderness at the top of our world. I believe you can begin to see why Nordheim is often referred to as the divided land, my prince. It is not just the geography or the long-standing feud between Asgard and Vanaheim. It is a place where the necessity of survival dictates the luxury of the people's cultural expression, where division seems built into the very fabric of life. The people of the North live tribal lives, following their chieftain in the struggle to survive against the raw element of nature. Their concerns are the concerns of those who struggle to eat, to drink, and to find safe shelter. The people of the South live in more regimented lives, and their society is surprisingly complex. The southern reaches of Nordheim, in Asgard and Vanaheim alike, are ruled by dozens of petty kings and queens. You must remember this, for when you ascend to the throne, my prince. Diplomacy with Nordheim, much like with Hyperborea, is diplomacy with dozens, possibly hundreds of monarchs. These rulers pale in comparison to your father's own throne. The kings and queens of Nordheim usually rule no more than a handful of settlements over which they can directly enforce their will. Beneath the monarchs are the Jarls, local rulers akin to our own barons. Jarls normally control only a settlement or two, and they pledge themselves to a local monarch for greater protection. House Jarls, both male and female, serve as the personal guard to monarchs and Jarls, while a thrall is the title of a Nordheimer slave. Both Vanir and Aesir have a system of land ownership that prevents any thralls and most freedmen from owning property, but a person can come to prove themselves and rise in rank via the weight of their deeds within the community. Thralls can even earn their freedom, and while freedmen cannot own land, they can rise in station to become landed if they can prove themselves. Many freedmen in Nordheim will dedicate themselves to raiding parties as a result. 
hoping to prove themselves in battle in order to become fully accepted by society. As different as the people of Nordheim can be, they are often more alike. They are all fierce warriors, constantly raiding both one another and the lands across their borders. Both the Aesir and the Nier have a strong sense of personal honor. They do not farm, instead relying on hunting and gathering the bounty of their sparse land. This lack of agriculture means that both the Aesir and Veneer rely heavily on raiding to fulfill the needs of their community. They often cross the border into Hyperborea, Pictland, and more rarely Samaria. The longships of the Veneer allow them to travel even further afield. Both groups are loud. They drink openly and carouse throughout the night. I believe you can see where your father picked up the habit. Yes, my prince, as I'm sure you have heard a million times by now, King Conan traveled extensively across Nordheim in his youth. The Aesir have a loose alliance with your father's people, the Sumerians, and it is common for both Sumerians and Aesir to cross the border to travel and fight in a strange land. Your father learned much while fighting in Aesir war parties, and he took to their way of life. The wild, free nature of the Nordheimer resonated within the king's soul, and he carries the mark of it with him even today. Uh, what, what was I saying? Ah yes, the similarities among the Nordheimer. As mentioned, the Nordheimer do not force their women into a subservient position. Instead, they are treated as equals. Women can fight on raids. They can even come to own land and slaves in Nordheim. They also occupy a unique spiritual position among both the Asgardians and the Vanir. This position is known as the Volva, important seers among their people. The Volva were looked at as the messengers of the gods bringers of prophecy and keepers of lore. They were expected to maintain the oral history of their clan or tribe, and they were central to the propagation of Nordheimer culture. There are male priests in the south of Nordheim, but even there, the Volva takes precedence over others. They act as healers, teachers, spiritual guides, and midwives. There is no king, queen, or chieftain in Nordheim that would not heed the words of the Volva, and you would do well to remember this again, my prince. Nordheim has a reputation for being a harsh and unforgiving land, a reputation that is well earned, I can assure you. But it is also a land of bounty in its way. The Blue and Iglofian Mountains are rich in ores of all kinds, and the people of Nordheim work tin, copper, Nickel, zinc, silver, gold, and iron. There is a group of Nordheimer who dwell in the northernmost reaches of the mountains, known as the Volunder. The Volunder are a caste of hereditary smiths who mine the ore of Nordheim and work it into alloys beyond compare. They live in their own communities and maintain vast smithies and forges carved beneath the earth into the mountainsides. The Volunder pass down the secrets of their craft to their offspring, and they offer their trade to others in exchange for protection. Because of this, the Volunder have come to occupy a neutral role in Nordheimer culture. Both the Aesir and Veneer trade furs, food, and protection to the Volunder in exchange for finely crafted weapons and armor. Scale mail, conical helms, and stout weapons of iron are ubiquitous across Nordheim because of the Volunder. Even the nomadic tribes make a point to come down from their frozen wasteland to trade with these smiths occasionally. There are some who say that these lifelong craftsmen possess magical powers, that they can inscribe powerful runes into their weaponry at the behest of their gods. In my experience, my prince, 
Many such claims are nothing more than fancy. But I have also traveled far enough to know that nothing is truly discountable. This world is filled with strange and wondrous things, my boy. Perhaps the Volunder can produce enchanted weapons, perhaps not. The only way to truly know would be to seek one out to procure their services. Nordheim is a fractious place, my prince, but its people are hardy, stubborn to a near fault, and consummate warriors. Those who face their raiders fear them, but those who can impress them make fast, loyal allies for life. In many ways they are similar to your father's own people, but rather than being of dour and sullen countenance, the Nordheimer burn brightly. They are loud, happy, and drink deeply of honeyed mead whenever they have a chance. They are a force to be reckoned with, and we should be thankful that the harsh nature of their homeland and its geography, oppressed by the far northern cold and surrounded by enemies, have conspired to keep the Nordheimer isolated from the rest of the world. In many ways, Nordheim is a self-contained universe of its own, cut off from the rest of Hyboria. Men who travel there forget the wider world, and yet, somehow, in the savage endeavor of survival, they also find clarity in Nordheim. Purpose. Sometimes I think it is these things that your father misses most about his bygone days of youth. <gasps> you must excuse me, my prince. I believe we have lost track of the time. The hour grows late and my aged eyes grow weary. Nordheim is a fascinating, complicated land. The truth is that I could wax on about it for many hours more and we still would not learn all there is to know. I hope I have at least whet your curiosity for now. Come to see me again in the morning, my boy. We can continue our discussion then. I am, as always, happy to have someone willing to listen to me ramble. Have a good night, my prince. Close the door behind you when you go.